Hello and uh, welcome to the Oscilloscope Deep Dive. Um, my name is Ed Wright. With me over there, we have Pierre Alexandre. Uh, uh, I can't do your surname. Please forgive me. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. At least you say Pierre Alexandre and you don't call me just Pierre. It's fine. Pierre Alexandre okay. Tremblay. <laughs> okay. Apologies. Um, you, the, the people who followed this may well have noticed that we don't have Ben with us today. This is because we tried to record this yesterday. We had various different issues. Um, ben can't make it with us today. Pierre is with us, um, and that's brilliant, you know. Um, and uh, thank you so much for making the time to come back and join us again. Um, equally, Charles isn't able to take with us tonight, so I'm pushing buttons as well. So if there are any howlers, that's totally my fault, and I apologise. Um, but yeah, great to have you back with us. It's uh, it's going to be a little bit weird, kind of not referring to stuff we talked about yesterday, because we happily oh, if we get if, us... yeah. <laughs> if we get yeah. as excited as we were, it's oh be totally, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, so in which case we're going to hear a piece of yours in a minute. Um which is kind of a logical way to go, um, entitled A Single Word Is Not Enough. Um, is there anything you want to tell people about it as a thing before they kind of engage with it? Uh, yeah, I try to keep titles and program note as poetic and as open as they can be. I like music to express something, but not necessarily to shove it down people's throats. So the piece is called Single Word is Not Enough because it was composed when I was in Berlin trying to learn German while I've been living in England for a certain number of years now, but I'm French-Canadian, so I'm always translating. <laughs> and talking yeah. about music is also another layer of translation, and I've been an academic for a certain number of years now, helping PhD students or master's students to verbalize their strong musical intuition. I've had been lucky to have very good students. So always this idea of translation, which where words or any other means seems to fail the original, or that's a negative way to see it. We can also say that because there's no perfect overlap, there's no perfect semantic equivalent uh, one word for another word, um, the fields that are needed, the impressionist vocabulary, the, voc the, the, the paragraph you need to explain an idea that could be musical or in another language, could also shed light. If it's the same person, uh, it could also shed a new light on the thing because you, you have to approach it from another perspective. And I find that very interesting and enriching uh, and frustrating when I'm trying to organize an <laughs> idea and suddenly, ah, it's not exactly that word that I know exists in English, but in French, I cannot find that word. Um, and the other way around. So I thought that it was a good, interesting thing to try to express in music because music is really good at having multiple perspective on things uh, because it's open, even when you, people talk about semantics and that's controversial, a given culture will agree on certain codes and you can compose with those codes or at the limits. And that's what that piece is about. It's about trying to make sense of saying something either through repetition, which is the first movement, or through uh, deep gaze at it, so contemplation, which is the second movement, and then Otherwise, through over explaining it and maybe uh, losing t your patience, which is the third movement. So this was the material. And then I had a series of composition around the time and all of them decided we might talk about that later, but how it links to the series of pieces. The idea was to <clears throat> make a piece that would become the template to other pieces, not as a lazy exercise of uh, saving time, but more as um as a formal exercise which was trying to push me musically somewhere else. So the title emerged as a single word is not enough, which is in one word only. And it's usually translated as a phrase 
shrunk in one word in whichever language the piece is played in so in it was premiere in german so the name is in german on the forthcoming album but it's uh, un seul mot ne suffit pas in french a single word is not enough in english so that's the piece that's what people should think about it's about the impossibility the rich and the frustrating impossibility of translation there we are um I don't think I need to say anything, anything more for that for an introduction, really. Um, so, without any more words, a single word is not enough. Thank you very much.
Well, there we are. That's um, an amazing piece. And uh, thank you so much, Pierre. Um, that, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I really... I, I really like that. Um, yeah, I mean, it struck me when you when you were talking about it to start with. You mentioned about the um, translation of the title and and those sort of ideas. I mean, is it important that there isn't actually any in a in a real really facile sense linguistic reference in there? I mean that that's hmm. the moment you start talking about language and translation and all of a sudden we have this piece that is on a superficial le level utterly devoid of linguistic speech in that sense um was that a conscious was that a conscious decision question. or was Yes, it is. Because obviously, if I take a piece about translation and I put voice in there, this is really first degree. <laughs> as much as I like my things to be readable, I like them to be readable with subtlety, depth, and also a certain openness. So if I do a tune about uh, um, uh, translation and I have translated voices, I think that there's not much where it can go. Mm. There's, not, there's not a lot. In this case, instead, I took a very clear motif. Very, very clear. Bing, 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 bing. <laughs> ling, 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 ling. <laughs> Dropping the papadum, uh, the papadum metal thing, which obviously we're not performing that order. But that, there's, there's a lot of things to be said with this thing. First, yeah. it is a very clear melodic material. So suddenly you have an object, a gestalt, a sentence, which... If you don't, you have or you not have musical training, you will hear that as a thing. My son was very young when I composed it through the walls, and he said, Papa, you've not played this tune for a long time. Bing, 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 bing. bing. <laughs> it was very clear. This is, it's, it's really obsessive permutation of a sentence. What is subtler yeah. is that throughout that first movement, it's about the oppression of losing patience when you can repeat something. So I've edited the séquence done with these kind of droppings which happen in a studio. I've put them in order from the most organized set, which forms the first, let's call it a paragraph. All these sentences are junk in a, or a chapter or paragraph, whatever. Before the big pause, there are pauses, you know, there are chunks of repetition, yeah. pause, chunk of repetition, pause. And that's each of them is more and more, uh, that sentence gets more and more complicated. Like it's less, more and more staggered and I'm dropping bits and I'm picking them up and it doesn't, it's not, it's dirtier and dirtier. And the, the third one, it's, it's getting even more. And the fourth one, it's not even finishing the sentence and I grab the stuff before the end. And so it's about, it's crumbling, it's crumbling. <clears throat> um, that reads, I think that you don't need to be a musician or a semiologist to understand that there is something going on and it's not going well. You also understand that there is a human manipulating these things. They sound like a sound that you're not too sure where it's from, but you really hear something being manipulated. It's not uh, clean, it's not artificially or um, uh, synthesized. It really sounds like somebody is manipulating something. There is a deliberate human presence and a deliberate human gesture, which gets frustrating. Frustrated. So, a point there where you see things are happening and it's not going well for that poor person <laughs> doing the thing. <laughs> and there is a context in which this gesture is happening, which at the beginning is very um, sparse. But it's not really sparse. It's just it got the same sparseness than when you're in the forest and you have a bird singing near and a bird singing far. But there's a lot. If when you start to do deep listening in the forest, it's far from sparse. It's just got depth. Like yeah. the Murray Sheffer, like high fidelity. And what I'm doing as a poetic metaphor is I'm compressing and going more and more lo-fi as the movement goes. So, 
different layers are getting scrunched. So what is an artificial tail, synthesis tail at the beginning, becomes more and more as equal with the sustain of these melodies. What was a slight low-end echo to this phase becomes this fat bass that is triggered with a huge bass drum, but is um, slight irritating scratch and their echo that are hard pan become really oppressive and as main voices. They were third degree voices, they are now first degree voices. So they were the back choir and suddenly the, the, the protagonists. Or at the end. So all of this kind of all of these means to articulate that narrative are composed. It's not, they're all saying yeah. the same, they're, they're all going the same route of saying the same thing, using their own language, be it orchestration, density, mixing, sound design, uh, saturation of auditory streams, so perceptual ways of listening the music or the streams or the sounds. So all of these things are, I use as a metaphor. And there, there's a clear poetry. I'm going that way. I've got that thing to say. And I'm using all the means I can. So then if I was to be too explicit with words, it would bu burst the poetry. So for me, there's enough Absolutely. things, you know. And then the second movement, the same thing. It's this big drone. It's not really a drone. You've got three voices. <laughs> and the three voices are segregated enough so we hear three voices but together enough so we hear one texture but that texture starts sparse and there's a kind of angelic counterpoint with the rocks being the friction of rock which is the kind of the opposite of the big droney synth i said you know it's it's very mm. textural we bring back a human presence indirect it's not a human but there is a clear manipulation but again, that movement gets denser and more. It's about the incomprehension, the incomprehension of translation. So it cannot be a happy ending. It's, it's got that <laughs> thickness, and the more you deep into like deep into your meditation, the more you understand that you don't understand roughly. So there's this sense of beautiful oppression that happens throughout that movement, if I can say that. Yeah. And then you lose patience. And the last gesture is about like hyper articulation, re explaining and explaining, but it's really articulated uh, until you get to the end where it says, Ah, I've had enough. <laughs> and then you do it again. Bing, bang, bing, bang, bang, bing, bang, bing, bang, bang, and I'm done. And then boom. And by <laughs> using that very strong gesture, which we haven't heard for 10 minutes by then, yeah. it brings this, it's a classic. You know, it's 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 a classic trope of composing time-based music. You bring back the intro to finish it, but in a certain way, it's got the the the, the third movement playing on and the second movement. So if you got like all the material is densified to the extreme at that point, where you've got the archetype, but you also have this and you also have that, and it's all, and then it stops, and you know that it must be finished because there's nowhere to go. So I thought that this has a enough openness in terms of it sounds good so if you're there if you're in there to for the sound you've got your treat if you're in there for the poetry of the kind of various sounds talking to each other or pushing against each other you've got that if you're in there to try to give or to just let go and enjoy there are all these cues that bring you images and poetry of anecdotes which for me, gives another layer of translation of what I'm trying to say, knowing really well that it's not, I'm not using a discursive language. Music is, even talking about language with music is, is problematic to start with. Mm. I'm tapping into the various language metaphor that we use to talk about electroacoustic music or act, it's, it's made for active listening, it's music that is made for a concert space. So it brings loads of codes that I can use and abuse to convey this in the various modes. So yeah, this is this is this is what I like about it. It's both open, but it's also a powerful way for me to get off something of my chest or my soul. It's really organic for me. It's really it's a bit like poetry is, and and I okay. would say that some people might say that. Uh, 
Because some people find uh, electroacoustic music a bit uh, difficult, or that my, or even those who like electroacoustic music might find that my codes are maybe there's too much pop sound, or there's too much harmony, or there's too much melody, <laughs> or there's too much instrument. But you know, we're surrounded by all these things, and and I think there's a there is something to be, there's something to be said about this kind of sense of the poetry of that cohabitation. I think these mm. cues together give there's enough noise in the message for it to be fruitful and and open and oniric brings a bit of dreamy imagination to it all. It's not like an, a, a boring news uh, talking about the weather because that's there's no <laughs> ambiguity there, but it's not necessarily what I want for my art. I, I need art to be cathartic and. And also, sorry, I keep, I can't stop talking. We've talked about so no, many no, things no. yesterday you know, as well. We, we, so it's just we're, we're here to listen to things and delve that's into very them, kind. So it's great. Just, you know? Like there's half of the discussions of yesterday that I keep emerging, plus the tune, plus the yeah. oh, there's so many things. Um, and yeah, Absolutely. we haven't said I'm in an hotel room here because I was I gave a workshop all day, so I. I'm How both, was it? I meant to ask. Yeah, it, it went it went really well for the first day. It's a five day workshop. Yeah. So we're it's going well, but uh, yeah. So I'm uh, I'm a bit spaced. spaced. You have to help me. Like if if I'm going yeah. too many tangents, help me. No, help me no. I mean, like, this is this is the point of these things is to be able to indulge in these tangents and actually <laughs> delve into that. No, so it's great. Um, I mean the the one that struck me then coming from that is that. Yeah, you spoke very much about having these different languages and dialogues um, and this very sort of, I mean, at the start it feels very reminiscent of the sort of old school acousmatic tape type approach. I mean, it's it's not quite spliced together, um, I don't know, casserole dishes, but it's not far off that sort of feel. Um <laughs> in that sort of human agency of a thing um and yeah all of a sudden you've got this stuff that sort of blurs into sort of more of a kind of ambient kind of feel and so then this very glitch based thing um i i i'm kind of intrigued because the way you were talking about this poetry in this movie between worlds um there's a really obvious demarcation between each movement and section um and from what you say it feels like in your mind some of that may be a bit more blurred than that delineation may suggest. I mean, yeah, what what yeah. caused you to take that approach in particular? So it's interesting you talk about delineation because for me they are there's a difference between the readability of the form, which you're absolutely right. Yeah. I I try to make very clear because. I'm impatient in the sense that I go to, I don't want to, to go in a concert where I feel the composer is just listening to himself. Yeah. I cannot stand that ever. And I think <laughs> it's a Bernard, Bernard Parmigiani in one of his workshop that he said he was using his, uh, his beloved, uh, as, as a good tester, like, tell me when I'm an old composer listening to his own sound. That is very important for me that it's never yep. the case. I Otherwise, I can just do albums for myself and my three friends. That's not the point. For me, there is a sense of trying to do, maybe it's a, a vanity, I would say, but a desire to make art music that is expressive and beyond entertainment and could propose something or allow a certain catharsis but not for my chummies you know like it's <laughs> not tunes for my chummies you don't if you need a phd to get my music i've failed if you have a phd and you don't enjoy it it might be that you don't get it they're fine but it there is enough depth in there i think for somebody yeah. I'm certain, actually, there's enough depth in the, in the... I've got to stop being falsely falsely modest. There's enough depth in there that if you listen beyond the foreground, you will hear a lot of amazing detail and carefully crafted things. And that is... I took that from the pop world. And that is not in movements. That's within all my music. 
it's coming. Uh, so your idea of the styles, I don't think that each section is a relation to a given period or a given style. For me, it's much more organic. Mm. All the musics that I listen, I, I keep saying that there's one percent of every music that is good and there's a lot of pop music that is done therefore there's 99% of a lot is a lot you know but it's still <laughs> 99% and it's still 1% of a lot is a lot if you listen to yeah. the quality of arrangement and also when I say arrangement is the intrinsic you know a Ravel type approach to composition where orchestration is impossibly intertwined within the writing electroacoustic it's not an accident that all of that is born in France, you know, that the French orchestrators were magnificent, but it became mm. very, very much intertwined late 19th century. Uh, some people would say earlier, but I would say that it became a clear act then. And yeah. I think that you have a lot of that in heritage in all of the studio music, including the Beatles, including Bjork, including Radiohead, including some of the quintessence of quality pop music as well like all the trevor horn arrangements of seal are incredibly incredibly well crafted it sounds like thick hair like you know air is is no but you know not hair with an h air with air so it's it's incredibly spatial and breathy yeah so you think it's light but in effect you start to listen and there's about a dozen instrument which makes it really rich but it's kind of moist. That's the word. It's like it's really <laughs> enveloping, and that level of craft in electroacoustic is really rare because one percent of electroacoustic is good, which there's not a lot of being done. So it means that good electroacoustic is a rare thing, and it's good. We can scratch around. What I like very much in the last twenty years is the digitalization because of all these streaming service and all that mm. stuff. You have access to a lot more music than before. Like people will say, yeah, but there was a way to get my tapes from Japan. Yeah, good for you if you had the money and the connection. But if you lived yeah. outside of that network, you were incredibly isolated. And if you were in a place like Montreal in the 90s, which I was, it gave me incredible opportunities to work as uh, the technician for the first series of festival run by Robert Dormand. So all the rien avoir was running the tracks. It was all composers who were tech so that's where my yeah. pieces were listened by Chillon, Parmigiani Bell, all these guys I run the tech for them and I get feedback yeah. on my music by them it was amazing but it was also the Montreal school at the peak of the Montreal school which means that it was so strong it created the vacuum around it and Montreal is a small place it's big but it's a mm. small place it's not like in the UK where you have so many big cities with density of cities so north america yeah. is, is sparse so if you're in montreal and you happen to not do what is the dominant culture you struggle you struggle yeah. when you do the dominant thing too by the way because <laughs> there's no space too many so so for me to go in europe and to discover a place where many conflicting vision of music could cohabitate in peace or in war, I don't care, they actually exist and cohabitate, was incredibly beautiful. And the fact that I always kept my things like the rap production and the pop practice, the contemporary jazz and the electroacoustic separate, when mm. I started to start, a few of my friends thought it was artificial, but it was a way to keep sane. When I moved to my PhD in, in Birmingham and John T just started to poke at, so why do I keep them separate? And allowing me to start <laughs> to think, assume the fact I was yeah. thinking of them holistically. But it's cross-class, it's cross-genre, it's cross-intersubjectivities. Each of these fields, especially at the time, didn't understand each other. And no, therefore... Very much so. It, you know, like a few years ago, the Pulitzer was given to, like, to this amazing Kendrick Lamar, you know? That created quite a commotion for people who were not ready to be told that there is excellence everywhere but for me yeah. it's always been the case and but i'm happy i'm not alone anymore but it and i was not alone i was not at the forefront in montreal there were very few of us in netherlands there was a bit more in new york there were a bit more but they were far so for me discovering all that 
that there was something beyond confrontation. There was a proper mm -hmm. meshing mutation. That's actually the way that the Montreal School is born. If you look at the early Empreinte Digital, you've got somebody like Yves Daou, who made this, um, these amazing albums with anecdotes. We were, I think we were talking about that yesterday. So this, this, yes, uh, well. cohabitation, this cohabitation of these fantastic sounds who are both referential in terms of it's a phone ringing and it's somebody playing the harpsichord. So both the harpsichord as a musical instrument, but being played by a human. And the fact they share, they share some notes and the space, then suddenly there are some boundaries between modes of listening and between representations, modes of representations and modes of musicking. Is it pitch? Mm. Is it not pitch? Is it that become blurry and allow a very fruitful and beautiful images and cohabitations coming in? So that's the way I see that. So yes, you have a bass drum in my music and a fat bass, and you have melodic pitch, very instrumental. They are not musical instrument. It's a synthesizer that is triggered by a max patch, but it's actually an analog one that was sampled and then processed in the DAW. So it's crossing over the purist. Am I a modularist or am I a, a laptopist? I'm both. Is that a yeah. real bass or an electric bass or a double bass or a synth bass? Uh, all of them and processed. And with a fake fundamental done with a, a super collider patch. For me, they're all, there's one tool, it's my ears, and another tool, what's between the two. <laughs> I'm just feeding from everything I listen to. So these papadum melody, I don't know what you call them, the kind of metal dish you get when you buy papadum in Indian restaurant. Yeah, like the round thing with little hands. Metal, bling, but you've heard the sound in my tune. You've heard yes. these sounds. You yeah. wash, I was washing the dish and I heard this and I said, this is genius. So from, yeah. from this sound, that was a melody that emerged from uh, uh, a kind of, um, I don't know, uh, accidental manipulation, but my ears were open. That's the whole point. Yeah. You walk around with your ears open and see, I must have been asking myself that day, I want to do a fixed media piece, but I'm tired of fixed media <laughs> sound. I want to have traces of human presence and that, and I'm tired. I want to bring more pitch. So that was a way to be pitchy without having a tune. It was a yeah. way to have a manipulation without having an instrument. It was a way to be instrumental uh, without having a performer, et cetera, et cetera. So, so for me, that was a solution that emerged from a poetic question with ears wide open. And then yeah. composing is the work after that, but it's these intuitions that will happen only if you listen, if you stop the taxonomy beforehand. If, if composing is an act of curiosity, mm -hmm. and um, this is where art is interesting for me, is when it starts yeah. to, it, it stays open to the world. So the world is just throwing stuff at you and you listen and you do stuff with it. So that's, that was an example. And my module synth sometimes is at the forefront, sometimes in the background, sometimes it's some clever algorithm, sometimes just a bad plugin. So you've had, in, in that to have like filter drops like these, filter drops throughout the tune while literally bandpass filter for suspension because it works is yeah. it clever no is it is, <laughs> no it's not clever is it is it um uh, but neither is a perfect DFE? cadence but it still works yeah, exactly <laughs> but when if that's what you need you that's what you do it and that's what you you need that you do it you get it and it's fine so sometimes so for me that's it so the composition is that negotiation space where Sometimes you know what you want and you deliver mm -hmm. it. And sometimes you think you know what you want, but you keep that sense of availability where you might not get what you want, but what you get is better than what you wanted, or at least it sheds light on what you thought you wanted. And that links very yes. much with today's workshop. So. The workshop is around this research project where we design tools of machine learning and machine listening and to give them to musicians. A lot of these tools exist already, um, but how they're given, how they're, and, and how they're discussed. So 
when you mythify the composer as somebody who has God-given fixed ideas, you're... Well, first, it's a lie. Second, it gives <laughs> a lot of power to that person if they encourage that myth because it gives them the next-to-God power, which you, if you go back to the white, male, bourgeois, privileged, patriarchy approach of making music, where there's, the compo there's God, then the composer, then the conductor, then the first violin, you know, like, it comes yeah. with, and it comes with the dots, and if you, like, it comes with, it's <laughs> so wrong in so many ways. It yes. did amazing music. Um, the politics of it is catastrophe. Uh, yeah. The narrative of, and the history writing around that is is problematic, and we all know that. Sheffer yeah. was quite ahead of time, you know. When he wrote his his, his stuff in the forties and early fifties, France was still a, a colonial power, yet he was using let's call it world music, which is a problematic word today. But at the time, for mm. a colony to consider the culture of other, of their mm. colonies, uh, to say the word. Definitely a step in yeah, the right was, direction. He, he was Absolutely. listening it for it in saying that the system that the supreme white music was having was not the right system to listen to that music. It was already quite a big crack in the system. And I think that uh, he became a bit, he didn't become as good, like he, he lost a bit of his mojo as he, he got more systematic and all the politics about but yeah the early ideas of reduced listening they are problematic in another way which i will talk about in a second but they were okay. really useful to think beyond the you know quintessence of supreme Mm. German German approach to to music, which if you look at those people who defend that music today, it smells funny, you know, like the all the <laughs> Schenkerian stuff that happened in the last few years. Absolutely, like, that was it, uh, that funny. that really blew up on everybody, didn't it? All of a sudden, but it's just suddenly yeah. people notice that the people who hold the discourse of the superior of that music takes about other superiority of the same culture, and you say, "Hey, dude, chill out," mm. you know. So, but to go back with the problem, this is a bit mm. in link with that. So, Schaeferian's problem is that promoting plastic listening because that's what he does it's listening like phenomenological you listen mm -hmm. to the sound out of their context it's very rich to compare sound with sound and show that different values but it doesn't talk about musicking no sound is pure and music no. is really always encoded in a culture in a subculture and that these codes if you're aware of them you no know, talking about pure music is complete bollocks again it's really it's the blind privilege approach. So we can listen to these music the way we want, but we have to understand that we might not capture everything. We might miss the point. Doesn't mean that we cannot enjoy them, but we have to understand that we're outsiders having the same way when Kendrick Lamar won the Pulitzer and you've got people saying, I can't believe like giving this guy is this type of music. I say, have you actually listened? Oh, I don't, you know, no, but, yeah. you know, you tell people they don't give quality to listening to your music before judging it, and then you don't give their music quality listening before judging it. You're doing the same thing. If you don't Absolutely. spend a thousand hours listening to your history of hip-hop and rap and Afro-American political music, because that's what he's done with Pimp and Butterfly, it's fantastic, and you don't think about the context it with in which it is, which is what are the options for poor West Coast Americans, which is where Kendrick mm. Lamar comes from, social political options, then you don't have a clue what he's talking about, what his vernacular is talking about, what is language, what is poetry, what is music, why is music is so violent sometimes, why is relationship to authority is like this. Like, it's, and because I work as a rap producer, this is part of my background. So when I heard the Pimp and Butterfly, it floored me. It is an absolute masterpiece. Like in any style of music, that album is mind-blowing. Now, I don't say that very often, 
I can no, tell no, if no, it's true. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but that album, you go for it. And you'll say, oh, yeah, you didn't get that for this album. You got that for the album that follows. Yes, like every single Pulitzer. Like, that's always the case. It's supposed to not be a career prize, but it's always a career prize. Mm. It, the, you know, it's never for a given work for real. It, they take the last work of somebody and it's usually for the back catalog or mostly. So it, there was no difference whatsoever. And you read the article and I can tell you that because I didn't know all of this, but mm. there was a huge, when people started to push back, people were tired. It was the right momentum because there was a great counter pushback saying, no, yeah. no, 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 this is, this is the right thing and it should have happened long ago. So all of that to say mm -hmm. that my music is not about confrontation. It's not about, yeah. it's about assimilation. It's about art evolving like anything, like COVID, through mutation. Yes. You have to mutate or you die. So I've got, I'm really not interested by music that sounds like well-produced Parmigiani because if I want to listen to Parmigiani, I'm going to listen to the guy. And if I want to listen to well-produced stuff, I'm going to listen. But there is an essence. There, there's a roughness in Parmigiani. There's even more roughness in Chillon that, yes. gives it, that gives them a patina. There's something that is gritty. And you would not get that today with the tools of today in the time of today. It's, it was a fruit of a certain time, a certain technology, mm. a certain relationship, a certain depth of technique, a certain... And it sings because it was risky. It was, it was mm. contemporary at the time. Now, doing it today, 60 years down the line, is reproducing stuff. It's not very interesting. It's like if Beethoven had written Mozart, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, so like music is in. Am I right? Is there sixty years? Am I? Am I uh, eighty years? If I remember well, my music history. That's the kind of stuff I don't teach and I don't care about. Ballpark. Yeah. That's the right. That, that, that's the kind of stuff. So, I'm interested to see m mutations. I'm and so in my music, yes, you will have. I come from the Montreal school, and I'm very proud of the training I had. Had amazing teachers who show me the craft of that art, of that music. Mm. And I've learned it and I'm happy. And I've, let's, I wouldn't say I mastered it. I've taken from it everything it could give me. I also come from pop bass playing and a bit of punk bass playing and then prog rock and then jazz training, but always with an edge and then more improvised. That's something I've done too. And I've always, valorized people who were trying stuff instead of people who were trying to imitate John Coltrane. I love John Coltrane. I hate John Coltrane's <laughs> imitator. I cannot stand them because for <laughs> me, they're irrelevant. John Coltrane was contemporary music. Again, betraying the, the essence of a soul searching for something like with yeah. their soul and their materiality, their existence, their musical, everything. They soak in. The best metaphor I have for an artist is a sponge. You know, they go around, they suck the whole world, they distill, maybe a distilling bucket. Whiskey is a good, a good analogy. So, hey. Like, <laughs> hey, I'm in Scotland. I've got to, you know, I've got to think about this. So, so people, they soak the world and they distill what it is. So that makes me a Kandinsky fan, I reckon. You know, a child of your time. I so yeah, this, this training of the pop stuff, the studio stuff, the, the electroacoustic stuff, it, the jazz stuff, they all, it all is one thing. And the students, then the next step, my next teacher were my students. Mm. So Huddersfield is an interesting university because it's kind of a widening participation. It's mostly yeah. pop people who come and because I've got that background too, I understand that I cannot explain reduced listening with a Schaeferian example to start with because they won't relate. Yeah. But it happens you can teach sound object with Madonna as well, and it works. As the good students, like in any cohort, will get it, and they multiply the idea that you see it in their head. So that's the way I've discovered Kendrick Lamar. That's the way I've discovered that, like, even if it was the type of music I would have listened to, 
you know, mm. it's just, the world is a big place. There's a lot of music happening. I've discovered Mount Kimby, like talking about amazing production in, in electro pop music. Um, but it's not really pop. It's like, um, that should be on my radar, but it wasn't. But then a student came in with this as an example, because the way I teach composition is to try to help them do the best yeah. music they want to do. Yeah. which is the opposite of doing studies. Like, teaching, I think, is a catastrophe. But I think that giving them to try to understand what makes the piece that they really like, how it works for them. Yeah. That's the way I was told. I, was, I had an amazing mm. composing teacher. But it's much more demanding than just applying a recipe there. But like you do study one, then you do study two. But I can tell you that it doesn't work better or worse, but when it works, it works. Yeah. Yeah, so absolutely. so my ratio of good students, wouldn't, I wouldn't say is, is better or worse than the study system. But when the students are good, they become really good because they are, yeah. they really understand that there is something that makes a difference between the mediocre work that is on their radar or in their style of music and that piece that has something. Mm -hmm. And is it just for them? Is it for their subculture? So their intersubjective group? Is it a vocabulary thing? Is there anything they can translate from other music? And then they start to listen to music they don't like that way with the same inquisitive ear say, okay, so that French Canadian professor just said that this tune by Chillon is an absolute masterpiece. I can't stand the thing, but what did he say was good in there? Okay. So he goes mm. and listens and say, Oh, what? Is, oh, that's a delay. I never thought of it. Like, so they get, they chew in that stuff, the sponge, yeah. you know, the distillation, they chew in art stuff. They start to listen, walking in the street. They start to listen, Papa Dom bowls. When they wash them, they start to think <laughs> about the sonic world around them and the world period around them as material for their creative endeavors and then suddenly man you know suddenly there's not enough of a lifetime to do everything you want to do and that's great that's you know and they feed you and so that i was saying that they were good for me they because they come with yeah sparkling yeah. eyes sparkling ears and they want more <laughs> they want more <laughs> they want more yeah so bring it on i've got all the time in the world for students who want more but no yeah. time whatsoever by students who want to improve their marks and that i don't but but if they want to make more music, bring it on. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so much that you learn from just a slightly newer approach to the world, you know. The sort of fact that somebody comes with it or to you with something that's kind of this is the best thing they've ever heard. You know, it's like <laughs> ever wah, that sort of thing. And you're all of a sudden like, I've never even heard of this, what's this? Yeah. Kind of thing. Um well, sometimes just, sometimes just yeah. vocabulary. So Yes. Like it, they're, they're two, they're two good experience with students, uh, two good stories. So my first PhD students inherited me. It wasn't, he didn't come to study with me. It's just, I got the yeah. job and his supervisor left and he's an amazing person, which I will not name because he might not want the story out there, but okay, yeah. he's definitely out. He's definitely got no tastes whatsoever overlapping with mine into chamber music or contemporary music or yeah. so we thought. So, okay. uh, and he was my age. So we talk and I've learned so much from him because he had clear ideas. He had read a lot of things and we learned by respecting each other in our disagreement and showing each other, throwing at each other, the masterpiece of each other's background, plural backgrounds. Yeah. And the discussions and understanding all these notions of, um, communities, sub-communities, subjectivity, shared subjectivities and stuff. It was fantastic. So it was great. Another example was a, 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 an undergrad student who had a record deal. As his final project, he was doing something on a label, which exists. Yeah. And is that label is known for um, kind of electro-ambient stuff. And okay. he was keep, he come to me and he plays some his tune and I bored to death, like bored to death. Like <laughs> I want to die. 
after 10 seconds. Because what he does, he sets up these loops and it's just like, okay, so cool. But after 12 seconds, I know where you're going and you've got six more minutes. Really, please poke <laughs> me in the eye with a, a pen, do something. It's going to be much more interesting. <laughs> And he says, no, but I've got nothing to do with your gestural electroacoustic music. I don't care about these things. I say, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to not bore me to death. So first week goes like this. We see each other two weeks. Every, in two weeks later, same kind of things with same boring stuff. Third time round, I said, okay, there's something not going with. He says, yeah, but all the music I love is like this. I said, really? Okay. Next week, you, next time we meet, you bring me your absolute masterpiece. You know, the piece that you wish you'd compose and then you could die. And he brought me Taylor Dupree's Northern. Okay. And, and I press play. Frantically after, Google searches, yeah. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's an absolute masterpiece. I will okay. never be able to compose this, ever. Not because it's good or and I'm not good. It's because of the pace. It's not about the subjectivity. It's perfectly paced. It's completely, absolutely, totally not what he was doing. Okay. After one second, I said, oh, after five seconds, I said, and after 10 seconds, I said, this has nothing to do with your work. And he says, I love this. To and he looked at me and said, you're not supposed to like this. This is exactly like my work. Say, aha, because mm -hmm. I had better ears than him, because yeah. I had better training than him. I was able to hear major differences between the two. Taylor Dupree never stays where he is. The movements are minute, but the whole thing is in complete mutation. It's hypnotic. It's absolute genius. That album is just <laughs> nuts. I could listen to it on repeat. It's just, there's nothing happening, but there's a lot happening. It's this super yeah. beautiful mutating thing and once it's mutated like the pad has grown and the filter is open very slowly and the thing has become richer for like a minute and a half then suddenly the filter opens like and then there's this bass drum happening and it sounds huge but it's nothing it's just a little thing but because the, everything else has been so minute this mm. has a huge feeling and then further in there's a glitch transition which again would be not notice in my music because it's the normal flow of information, but in that piece, it feels like a tsunami. You know, like it's like, <gasps> what's happened there? Beautiful, fantastic album, highly recommended. Uh, that yeah, was, that's I, that's this evening's listening sorted. <laughs> no, but it's just it's just it was humble pie for Pierre Alexandre, the teacher. I was not yeah. able to understand that I was not understanding that the difference was in depth of listening more than aesthetics. Yeah. And therefore, I've learned a lot that day <laughs> Yeah, uh, about, about, okay, so how can I approach compositional teaching, which enables no blockage linked to any kind of aesthetical interests? Yeah. We go beyond that as soon as possible. And the idea of bringing Masterpiece in right away is a good conversation opener because mm. people can start to, you can see the level of listening, you can see where the interests of somebody lies because there's a lot of music you know there's a lot of music there's a lot of musicking there's a lot of ways of relating to music in one's life not in mm. everyone's life in in a single life there's no such thing as what music is for you is what music's music sing musicings <laughs> are for you for you as a plural human otherwise you're boring shit sorry to sorry you have to censor that word but if you only no, have no, one no. relationship <laughs> if you have one one relationship to music you're really boring life because yeah. life oh like human experiences are are a plenty and 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 musics are plenty and relationship to music in these different contexts including no music whatsoever is 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 what makes it so good, you know. I like blue cheese, mm -hmm. but maybe not all the time, and maybe not with uh, with my. Uh, I was about to say chocolate tart, but I've never tried it. But I mean, it might be intense. Like Stilton and chocolate might be quite something. There might be something maybe. to be said for that, yeah. <laughs> maybe not tonight. Let's put it like no. this. <laughs> maybe not with a glass Stick. of milk. Stick to the haggis and whiskey; you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow morning, haggis breakfast. Whiskey, oh, well. Maybe not. 
Yeah, well, we'll see. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Work, workshops could be interesting. I mean, <laughs> just thinking back on that, I mean, it's, um, I mean, keeping with that sort of teaching and learning kind of idea, um, there must be quite a big jump for some people to take to actually be able to bring their favourite masterpiece in. I'd imagine some people could be so nervous about that potentially, depending on how you frame that. <laughs> But you teach, you know that they're still fr they're still more worried about their own pieces and how it's going to be judged. So yeah. if you explain to them that what you try to understand is what they're trying to do, yeah. it actually is very good to establish a safe space. Yeah. And, and, and it's funny because we were supposed to talk about tunes, you know, the piece that you played earlier. But that's, yes. all li that's actually quite linked. I'm just... Yeah. I, I, okay. I might say that... Yeah, you'll see in a second. So you make yeah, a safe... Um, you, we talked about safe space. Mm -hmm. And that's important. So what can you get when you, you, you establish a space where somebody can come and be open? Because that's where the safe space is. Yeah. Somebody can be themselves and candid. In a composition class, that implies that you will not insist on imposing your value set. Or at least you will acknowledge when you do it that you're trying to understand something according to a certain value set. There's a transparency mm. of the power dynamic. There's a transparency of the expectations. There's a transparency of, okay, maybe that tune would work on a dance floor, but in this context, you have to do an active listening piece, which means that let's talk about radio mix. And then you bring, I've got two versions of the same piece, the dance floor and the radio mix, and it's less than a third in length, talking to the students, about how material is organized in time according to the mode of listening is a very valid discussion in any type of musicking. So mm. all of these ideas I bring when I compose. When I compose for when I make music, period. So if I make music in the in a in a pub where we make improv music and it's kind of a garage uh, the ground level is there, or it's in a cafe, or it's in the library, same music, same band, the startup point will be different. Where it's going to go will be different. It's, we react, we call it the magic reacting to the moment as improvisers, but fundamentally, if you think about it, there is an adaptation to the expectations of the context. You bring that to the concert hall, or the album, or the radio play, uh, of acousmatic music or music that is listened acousmatically, electromagnetic, <laughs> acousmatic, yeah. whichever. I don't personally. I I am a child of the acousmatic training. I bring too many things in it to be considered a purist, but I'm still part of that tradition. But the acousmatic listening, as a thing in itself, not as a reference to something else. Is, is really what I bring to the table when I compose a piece like you heard earlier. Mm. And therefore, it allows me to use instrumental gesture in a different way. Because I know, a bit like Dao we were talking earlier, I know that in that context, a harpsichord trill that is repeated, either clearly repeated or repeated by human, will be heard differently and for what mm. it is, and not for the notes only, but for the note, the instrument, the context, the acoustic, especially when the notes are taken by a phone a few seconds later. So all of that are codes, part of that poetry that I can build upon, but I've got to challenge it. If I don't challenge it, then I'm a boring producer. It's like more drool. Celine Dion of, of, of Acousmatic exists. There's a lot of it. Well, <laughs> because it's really well done, Celine Dion. It's incredibly well done. But it's the McDonald of gastronomy, you know? Like, you don't vomit, but it doesn't challenge you much. It doesn't bring you anything. You just feel the, you know, it fills the job. So, you know, I, I go to concerts and I hear yet another person noodling with a certain plugin of a certain brand and it sounds like that plugin. And then there will be the cliche this and cliche that. And at one point, you're just like, <laughs> give, me, give me something. Give me anything. Yeah. Risk. Take, put yourself, you know, put yourself there. 
put yeah. your gut on the table, your gut, your spirit, your soul, anything, but not just a pretty plastic thing, which is the same as the pretty plastic thing I've heard before and next, therefore, will be forgotten down the drain of... So take a risk. Worst case, mess it up, but at least do something. That's what, I, <laughs> that's what I'm asking for a concert. So if I get out there of there, like either challenge because I really didn't get it or enthusiast because I said, wow, I wish I had that idea. In both mm. cases, it's a win-win situation. But when I'm bored to death, but yet another, and it happens in all music, you know, Huddersfield Festival is a fantastic festival. It's the center of the world of contemporary music. But there's a lot of bad music in that too, don't worry. It's, and there's a lot of bad music on the radio and everywhere. So that's why I keep saying 1%. And I'm not saying that I'm part of that 1% all the time, don't worry, but <laughs> that's my aim. But we're all trying to be, yeah. But exactly, I'm going to take, I'm going to put myself on that line. I'm going to give yeah. everything to it. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't work, at least I've tried and I can learn from this. I can learn yeah. something. The next tune should be worse or better, but again, it shouldn't be the same. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, pulling pulling that back round and linking in with that again, um, and you're saying about trying to bring something more to it and expand ideas beyond, I mean, especially beyond that sort of superficiality of kind of gesture or plug-in or any of those sort of things. You've You've obviously got a piece which is about um, meaning and translation and the loss of that and then all of those implications. What I find quite interesting about that is this is clearly part of a series of pieces in that the sort of a single word is not enough and then there's sort of the, the invariant Two version. and three and four, yes, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, is, is that actually a sort of spun out kind of meta interpretation of the process or is this yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. that it, it is, was it is it, okay it's, it's, it's a brainchild of of having released my last empreinte digital so the one called la marée yeah is the, the tide in french yeah the tide is a cycle thing it's a beautiful hypnotic slow cycle thing and and yeah. that's the image i had the positive view i had of my music at the end of the process of the album making was that I get engrossed like the tide. I get engrossed mm. by, by certain emotions or certain ideas and both of them all the time. And then I go and I follow them and I challenge them. And then there's a the work that is given and that work has got, is going back. And then new ideas come in and the process goes. So there's this sense of a breather in the process. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's a good sense because each of the mm. works share, there's a kinship between the works. That's a polite way of saying it. At the very end of the production of the album, when you mix everything and you finish, you can't stand your own music. That's part of finishing an album. You've listened <laughs> to the things hundreds of times. Yes. You really, really cannot listen to it anymore. Yeah. So I made a list of Trumbleisms. Uh, on in my composition book and I say never again will I ever do any of those which obviously is not true but <laughs> I wrote that yeah and the problem is you write there you say oh maybe this one I could do again though I didn't finish this one and so it starts to challenge you know this is the beauty of abstraction versus uh, concreteness like you win when you abstract yourself and you make generalization you lose the detail, but you also spawn in that distortion that it creates, you spawn new ideas. So I really like that process of going between very concrete and very abstract and stuff. Yeah. Um, but so I do that. And um, as I said, one thing I do all the time is I start new projects from scratch, very far from each other, and they all converge to the same universe. My musical universe is quite clear. So I said, what could I do to make sure I don't converge to the same place? And I say, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to compose all the pieces that are coming against a template. I'm going to make a piece. That piece will be a piece about translation. And then from that, I'm going to compose the other pieces. So there's no way I can converge for nearer than the piece itself. So I cannot converge back to it. 
So how it will create a dead end into convergence and from it should something should emerge that is different. So uh, it was a challenge. It was also, at the beginning, I thought it would be easier to generate the material. It was actually much harder. So I don't recommend that exercise to anyone who <laughs> thinks you're going to have a free ride because I couldn't stand composing the piece that sounded the same. So it had to be, for me, it had to be relevant mm -hmm. musically and therefore starting from a constraint that is uh, sonic and made it quite difficult. Anyway, so, and I had a few commissions lined up. I had three by then. And not because I'm super popular, but because I'm super slow. So it was just, <laughs> I, could see the, I could see the horizon of a few years ahead. Yeah. And I spoke to the commissioner and say, are you interested in this? And they said, yeah, it's a, no problem. So I composed a single word is not enough two, which is the literal translation of the fixed media piece for Ksenia Pestova, uh, a virtuoso pianist who yep. had a commission for the Rolly Seaboard, which was the prototype at the time, because they thought that their market could be the contemporary music, crazy uh, um, piano virtuosity, but it wasn't because the interface is really not pianistic. In no. But we were the people who confirmed that to them by trying to recycle pianistic virtuosity. But my idea was to, how do I design, the piece is quite gestural, how do I make it a proper performance? So designing, mm. cutting the stuff, making instruments. And so I work really hard. It worked. Xenia worked incredibly hard to make it work, and it works. And there are different modes of play. And lots of them were abandoned, but in the piece, there's, she still have lots of agency. In that's piece. interesting and yeah. it's also because the rubber it's a piece of rubber so it has no sound so i always was interested to find a way to embody the sound in her gesture to make it readable and transparent mm -hmm. yet there's a lot because you know she could have done ding and then it's finished and the tune is playing back you know like there's no reason why she has to do anything so yeah how do i decide what she does to make the piece readable. So that was the first translation. Same sonic material, there's nothing new. It's actually, there's a compression, a time compression, but there's nothing new in the sonic material. It's only an embodiment question and how can I shrink the music to make it an aria da capo for the end of the variation series so it's shorter. We get it, we get it as the same tune, but we won't have to suffer 15 minutes. We get a, a shortcut. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's the, the second. And then there was this uh, piece by Seth Parker Woods, a uh, cellist. Yeah. Um, who, you know, the cello is the, the cliche. Ah, oh, the cello is like the human voice. It's the most lyrical instrument. I said, yeah, yeah, there's enough of that. And there's plenty of beautiful cello music. I made an instrumental. So I said, what well, that... Electroacoustic template is instrumental electroacoustic music. So I'll make electroacoustic instrumental cello, but not Lachaman, not something delicate. I want something raw. It's, I, I'm going to translate rawness by rawness. Mm -hmm. So I started to explore various ways in which that conflict, that compression of the high fidelity space, the conflict of... Um, a gesture that gets repeated and gets less and less high fidelity as well. It's less and less easy to do. Um, translated in that idea of a fight between the cellist and the electronics, but the cellist and his cello as well. So there is a very... And Seth is a dancer as well, so it's very embodied performance. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, there yeah, he was trained as a dancer too. So he really has this really physical way of playing. And I mm. said, that could be good. At the same time, my... The performer, the my performer, I never my performer, they are collaborators. So I don't want to ask him to do stuff that makes no sense in terms of power abuse. I more prefer to have like a kind of relationship where I bring material. So mm. hundreds of ideas, a session with Seth where we record stuff and I, is that possible to do this? What about that? What about this? And that starts to be mapped to archetypes. So this idea of, I told you earlier of zooming out and abstracting the musical material. So the layer of abstraction, mm -hmm. notation is one way of abstracting, but there are many different ways of abstracting. Uh, reduced listening is one way of abstracting. There are different codes you can use to abstract. Trying to think about how I can abstract the different 
structures of that piece in terms of time, in terms of decision, in terms of relation between the voices, and then getting the material from the cello and some gesture and say, oh yeah, this is this, this is that, this is this, this can be mapped to this, I can do that. Oh yeah, there was all these processing when I composed the fixed media part that I could use in real time. How does it work? Oh yeah, this works. So there was lots of, yep. oh, this sound I want to keep as is because it's a good grinder that reminds me of the cello in effect, actually. So there's this negotiation, it becomes very plastic, really fun. So I did that and the cello, all the rhythmic part of the cello are there. And if people are interested, they can listen to it online. It's on, um, it's on the score follower. So you can hear that, that version. Um, and then if, uh, uh, Heather Roach, which commissioned me a piece earlier in her life for bass clarinet and electronics, asked me to compose for her amazing duet with Effa Zöllner, uh, accordion. Yeah. And I said, oh yeah. Are you interested by this? She said, yeah, why not? So I did a session with <laughs> her, with Eva, and with the both of them together, taking the material from the original and from the translations. Yeah. Because now the body of work is building, you know? You've got translations already having subverted the original. And you say, okay, I've done this, I've done that. Oh, what about looking at it this way? So instead of having the consecutive elements being con in the same consecutive order, which I did with the cello. Mm -hmm. What about if I take elements of this plus elements of that? The harmony of this plus the rhythm of that. The, the, the grindness, the, gr the grittiness of the timbre of this plus the, uh, the kind of uh, interplay, rhythmical interplay of that section. Or what about this? What about that, that? So making all these kind of, that's why the fourth is called barter, is that it's a negotiation. Every bit was plundered from at least two sections, gelling ideas, mm. com combinatrix. And it made a piece, because my idea was to make a piece where it, the, the, what struck me when I saw Eva and, uh, and Heather play is the clear pleasure they have to play together. I said, yeah. so if I make them fight the tape, that makes no sense. I, it's much more a joyful thing where it should be celebrated, like a bit like Baroque music. So, so <laughs> I wanted to have some kind of Baroqueness yeah. to it instead. I, obviously, it's not Baroque whatsoever when you listen to the tune, but it's got, I wanted to have the There's pleasure. There's joy of to it. To, the yeah. chamber music playing, you can yeah. see that in the face of the chamber music players. Yeah. A and I thought that there is something there to be said. So composing material which makes sense of them as a whole instead of mm. them as antagonists to each other mm. was already quite important. So they, I built a duet sound world instead of a two duo sound world. And yeah. the electronic is really much an extension. Sometimes they will be conflicting, but it's, it's, it's not conflicting against each other, apart from one moment. I said, I cannot not do that. You know, like there needs to be a moment of jest, but it's, yes. it's a moment of jest in a piece of, of, co of, of, of uh, shared pleasure, let's put it like this. And therefore yeah. the jest becomes pleasurable. So that's the last translation I've done. There was a fifth translation, which was the pop remix, which, uh, All right. yeah, with my son singing the intro, as I told you, like, what is that tune again? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> and, um, but that was supposed to be for a kind of movie and that, uh, that didn't work. And then <laughs> Seth last month premiered a piece. He said, can I play the piece with a dancer? And because the, the way I notate, if you look at the cello piece, I really take a lot of care when I say the performers are collaborator. I'll take a lot mm. of care for them to be free. Mm. Not free in the sense they can do what they want, but they don't have a click track. They no. don't have... So there is a relationship built in the kind of tradition of chamber music where there is a certain elasticity that is uh, allowing them to uh, uh, own the music and uh, customize to their mm. musical desires or to the moment. And therefore, Seth knew that their elasticity would allow him to co-design a dance with a, a, a long-time friend. Like they were at primary school together, actually. Uh, oh, nice. His friend is, a, is, a, is, is a, you know, a, like a worldwide renowned dancer. And, and they said, oh, we have to collaborate. We have to. And he said, this would be the perfect thing. So they worked mm -hmm. together. 
It was premiered in New York last month. Um, oh, brilliant. Where they, they did a choreography on the music. But Seth asked me if he could touch. So there are sections, there are gestures that he's actually multiplied by four in terms of duration. And some of them that are faster, some of them are less, let's say, rigorous to the score. But I don't care because they had anchor points. And obviously when somebody yeah. throws himself in the air and then flips and arrives on the floor, what's important is the arrival point with the music more than sticking to the score <laughs> and yeah. the poor dancer arrives off beat, you know? So there's these relationship with anchor points which have been built and it's made this super organic thing. And again, this has been put online. So if people are interested to see how a kind of a single word is enough three B or three D <laughs> with a dancer, <laughs> because it's been translated with another Yeah, art absolutely. Form altogether. Yeah. So but, but in this case hands off. What we did is, in terms of my contribution, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take any, any credit because I did the music, obviously. And when we, we talked about the piece, I sent them my découpage, my, where I cut my various sections in terms of intensity and where it goes. So kind, mm. of, kind of very blunt narrative of where I see the overall shape of the, the structure going. But it was not a surprise for them because because the music is quite transparent, maybe a few adjustments mm. in it, and they had lots of fun. So I was really impressed when I saw the dance, and he's so good. Both of them, they're <laughs> amazing. But Seth, I knew already, but Rod, I, I didn't know. Yes. So I presume he was, but the quality of that dancing is, is just mind-blowing, and, the, and the, the setting and everything. So it's, it was really ah, interesting. There's still, that definitely had to be another Google search in a bit, I feel. <laughs> But no, I mean, it's a really interesting score to look at as well because it's it's very, I mean, it's very traditional as a score um, in that sort of <laughs> yeah, notes on paper. Okay. But it's it's also very nice in that you've got this sort of descriptive timeline as to what's going on. You feel like if you didn't have so yeah, there the are audio reasons, there, yeah. you could still yeah. gather where you were. Yeah. Kind of there, are three, there, are, there are three reasons. The first one, it's simple because I'm a very bad sight reader. I've always been. <laughs> oh, like, no. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. But some people are, no, no, no. There's a lot of good sight reader out there. Okay. And yeah. I, play with, I play with them. So it's embarrassing when people can read my own music faster than I can read it, even okay. if I yeah. wrote it, you know, like, yeah. so I'm, I'm really bad. And, um, and therefore it needs to be transparent for me. Hmm. There's also a relationship with uh, bandwidth. So for me, it's important to... to buy. First, every human is limited in bandwidth. That's a fact. Which hmm. means that if, I, if you spend that bandwidth of a performer on, on dots, you don't spend it on ears, or you don't spend it on energy, or you don't spend it on something else. And oh yeah, some people are good at reading, but they're still busy doing something else than relating to the sound the way I want them to relate to the sound. So in effect, there's an effort of distillation, translation again, mm. translating my musical intention and making sure that what I notate is the strict minimum to get what I really care about. And therefore, I can be completely anal about saying this is what you need to do. Not thing more, but not a single thing less. Because I'm not going full Fernie Howe on them and giving them impossible stuff to play. It's all very possible, but none of it is artificial. Not a single articulation is there for nothing. Mm. Including, third reason, these descriptive processing relationships. So you will see that my electronics is described both in interaction, in sound, and in reaction, in relationship with, it's, is it like an answer? Is it, uh, so I, I give the power relationship. So if you're a chamber music player and you know that your role is to do something that is equal power to something, it's a very different relationship to something that you play and you have a vague echo of, or something that you should be, you fight, but you're overpowered. Or beware, you're incredibly overamplified, so you don't play and it's playing for you. You know, like, these mm -hmm. are all processes I use, which change the relationship of the player with their instrument and with the music that is happening. And they have speakers. It's for choir speakers behind them, so 
they are in the sound. It's not the PA. There's nobody in front changing the sound. It's chamber music with speakers and the cello on stage projecting. So mm. it's exactly as if they played for a pianist, with a pianist for an audience, with another cello, with whatever. And that's the way I notated. That's so explaining that to the performer, but putting that in the score as the for me a key point for that music to work is putting the bias where I care about things. So I'm going to get the piece I care about that way. And it's worked so far well for most for most of my mixed music. No, that's a really, really, really interesting kind of approach. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware that the time is running away with us and this is the second evening that you've spent. Um, <laughs> and we have, we've managed to not talk about the same thing two days. So we've talked for no, four hours, into, like three and a half hours in two days yeah. and we haven't repeated ourselves. It was crazy. Absolutely, which is quite quite intriguing, really. I mean, so, so is there anything that you feel that you want to articulate about it or get off your chest that you think, oh, people are gripped? To understand this, you've got to get this, or or have we well covered that ground but by we, now? We, we've covered the poetry thing, which is yeah. important. We've covered the, the mutation more than confrontation, which I think is important to understand my music. If people can listen uh, to it the same way they should listen to the world, you know, and... Yeah. And, and the image will come if the image will come, and if they don't come, I'm sorry for them. Um, it's all coming out on an album. That piece plus three other there we pieces. Are. Yes. Oh yeah, the album. We have to plug the album. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, we have um, to plug this. Yeah, have to plug the album. <laughs> so yes, um, it's my fifth album on Empreinte Digital. I alternate like fixed media, mixed music, fixed media, mixed music. Now it's fixed media. It's four pieces. So there's this one, uh, which is instrumental, gestural, gritty, talking about the impossibility of translation. The album is called Four Poems. Um, in French, quatre poèmes, because the program notes are all geared towards an invitation like this, an idea yeah. what the piece is about, um, an incantation. But it's... They all share this idea of polysemy, or opening poly poly multiple reading and multiple meaning of each of these readings. Mm. Or multiple modes of listening, multiple approaches to to making sense of what's happening. Even a given object or a given sound that you hear will have its different connotations. Um, and I don't mind too much if it's an active listening, how people receive them in the sense that if they don't understand exactly what I try to say... Uh, it's not it's not so meant to be discursive in the or argumentative or dialectic or, <laughs> you know, pedagogic but it has it, it's it's not they're not novels they are poems so the storyline is more abstracted and it's more like images so there's a piece where i treat instrumental guitars and loops and stagnations and pianos in a very sound object way but also in a way that makes clear presence of a player, yet it relates to all the tradition of the production of these instruments, so they sound hyper real at the same time. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of meditative repetition in that piece, some of it blunt, some of it open. There's a love song to the north of England, uh, which was a 28 channel. A piece which has been down mixed. Oh, the album is released as well as files, so people can download uh, stereo, but also the multi-channel files. So, ah. all the mo yeah. So the music is mostly 5.1. That one has been down mixed, but I managed to keep the the um, the clarity of the space and the discourse into into a reduction in stereo. It works in 5.1. It works better. Obviously, it works better in a dome, but people don't yeah. have domes although i reckon <laughs> that when dolby if dolby atmos picks up and people have got the kind of 3d for real in their room then we can talk about a remix later down the line maybe in multi yeah maybe you know maybe Absolutely. Movies, but 
So there's this piece which is really candid with birds and pianos and a kettle, a kettle solo. Um, <laughs> beautiful kettle solo, I've got to say, because you know, absolutely, it, a kettle is 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 an art form in itself. When you listen to it as a music, it's got its own little arch and little. It's absolutely beautiful. And um, so, yeah, there's a lot of gritty synth in that one as well because it's post-Brexit England. So it's a love song in a tortured country. It's called Bucolic and Broken. So it's okay. got the bucolic, but it's also got the broken. And finally, there's a piece called Newsfeed, which is a 25-minute minute long contemplation of... Uh, news feeds in general the the shallow the shallow novelty of news feeds it's a bizarre beautiful trancy compressed dense it's not a comfortable listening but <laughs> it's it's not aggression in loudness it's it's really carefully orchestrated to be perfectly dense in the sense that it's too dense to be reduced like a wall of sound you reduce as one wall of sound mm -hmm. it's got enough density to uh, keep you on your toes all the time fantastic um, which i it's it has the latest one so it's always when the piece is just finished it's hard to have distance on it so <laughs> absolutely it's, it, it's been premiered on the radio last month uh in uh, Re czech republic a fantastic radio show um, and Radio Acoustica. Um, ah, and, and yeah. it's going to be, yeah, and it's going to be premiered in concert in Edinburgh in two weeks in multi-channel. So that's kind of, uh, so that's the album coming out soon. Uh, I received the masters are finished. The uh, texts are finished. Everything is finished. It's just ready to, ready to be, uh, to be released as soon as the production goes. Um, and I'm really excited about about it all. It's it's a it's it's it is continuing. So if I listen to yeah. my 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 other albums, I was listening to them the other day to compare some some things uh, more technical, listening to master and all that stuff. And yeah. I was just like, oh yeah, I, I live really well with the the previous album I did on as fixed media, quelques reflets. It has. It was the first sabbatical I composed in four studio. It was there's a unity of um, of concerns again, very political. The four works, but mm -hmm. um, there is there is a unity of thing. But I've moved on in terms of production, in terms of the rawness of the cohabitation. It's much more. Yes, I'm getting older. I can get, I can, I can, it's, it, there's a rawness I, I, I not only accept, but desire in the statements that I make now musically, mm. uh, that I was maybe not ready to assume when I did the previous album, but the piece is there, but you heard the piece today. It's, yeah. it's not repeating halfway. It's the, the bling, bling, bling going down they are bling blings and they are going down and they that happened explicitly many times it's not just yeah. like in passing so it's not because i'm indulgent you listen to the amount of work there is if you do micro listening and if you do your proper electroacoustic analysis mm. of this you'll find out there's not a single one that is repeated so you can imagine no, the amount of work is, that, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it is the craft is there there's no doubt so there's no free right Therefore, why did I do that as a competent? It's not only about composer, but as a competent producer of sound, there is a statement there that I decided to to, to take these tools that I have built through my teaching, through my listening, to my experience of making. Why do I go for that bareness and that essence? Mm. So, yeah, this this sense of essential to something more essential. So yeah, it is it is for me. But I'm nowhere near the bareness of 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 a lot of music. But this is for me going, <laughs> coming from that pop orchestrated thing. Yeah, going to another type of of 
of rawness, which is still very polished for my noise friends with whom I play all the time. They say, <laughs> oh, this is still way too clean. And I say, oh, yeah, but there is this thing. So, yeah, yeah, no, it's way too clean. I say, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Clean, clean that... dirt. Let's call it like this. Clean, clean, yeah. clean, 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 dirty or dirty clean. But there is something in, again, in between that liminal yeah. space, this, this, I'm touching something. I've but, got a feeling there. But that's something. coming from within your dialogue rather than necessarily exactly. from another frame of reference, which is. Yeah. And there's also, it's also an, a, 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 a radicality is easy. You just go full mm. on. Nuance, you know, like actually <laughs> radicality, like culture are on Facebook discussions, like uh, putting people like uh, uh, in a bucket or the other bucket. That's it's so easy mm. to make a discourse radically binary. Mm. I'm, I want to go much beyond that. I want to keep a... I want to explore the complex mesh of the mm. liminal space between these styles, between these conventions, between these timbre, these these roles, these musical roles, this development. It's all there's so much to explore in the middle. It's so beautifully messy. I love it. I think that is a absolutely fantastic moment to wrap it up don't you <laughs> you know that's just such a positive kind of yes like, yay <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. i hope people enjoy the album uh, yeah and I'm, if they don't i'm sorry for them i enjoy it that's already yeah, quite something absolutely so i really i mean do you have a time for when it's out yet at all or i date, or? could no i don't but it's should okay. be soon because everything is in the hands of the producer and jean francois is quite good at this so people should find it on electro cd okay soon. um electro well CD. i mean as and when it happens give me a shout and we'll try and sort of stick it up on on the oscilloscope page as well just for people who might want to follow it up you know as a as a thing and uh yeah um so Pierre is on. I mean, thank you so much for your time last night and tonight, and uh, <laughs> a, a, a wonderful piece and set of pieces. It's been um, been great talking to you. You know, um, thank, thank you for taking the time and making the time extra. You know, so it's it's hugely appreciated. My pleasure. It was great. Yeah, I thank you very much, and cool. I will Have a nice no evening. doubt speak to you at some point soon. Take Hopefully care. soon in person. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be great. Bye. Thank you very much.